Uninspired Scene by Orlando Miles. The characters are Brian, 10 years old, he's a leader, and Tommy, 10 years old, he questions everything. Setting is the fall Halloween at noontime, and at rise, Tommy and Brian walk into their treehouse. Tommy, look, I have everything planned out. We're going to be swimming in candy. What do you mean, Brian? I mean this. <laughs> What's that? This, my friend, is a map of the rich neighborhood that gives out big candy. Awesome. <laughs> I know it, ain't it? <laughs> I even got us two extra costumes so we can hit each house three times. Whoa, Wicked, that's a lot of candy. Yeah, I know. I, I planned this all to a T. Hmm. What's wrong? Seeing that we live on Debbie Street and Whittier is 30 minutes from here. But... And Belmont is another hour and a half. Your point? We're only 10 years old. We can't ride our bikes at night. How do you expect us to get there and back? You know, you know what? Forget it. New plan. I just had to ask. End of scene. Monologue exercise, object in a setting by Edward. The character is an old tattered King James Version Bible missing the cover. He smells old and worn. Setting is the chapel. I miss being read. I miss the warm hands on my pages. Oh, I know I don't look nice and new like the ones brought into the chapel, carried by the guys. I used to have someone to carry me, but that was all he did, carry me around for show. He rarely ever opened me so I could speak to him. I don't think he, he even cared what I had to say. One day I found my covers ripped off. I don't know why my pages in the back were disappearing. I know not where they went. If only one of these guys would pick me up. He might even read me. I still have hope and faith. End of monologue. This is a scene, an object in a specific setting by Edward. The characters are a Bible, an old worn King James Version Bible smells musty and Rusty, a 35 year old inmate, lonely. Setting is the chapel, Saturday afternoon chapel services. At rise, Rusty is sitting in the back row by the bookshelf. Oh, look, somebody is sitting right in front of me and he's not carrying a Bible. Man, why did I come here? I mean, other than the air conditioning, I mean, the AC is blasting, but I hope somebody noticed that he has no Bible. Everyone else has a book with them. What is this, a, a book study? Yes, a Bible study. Who said that? He only sees a worn out book with no cover. Me, I said it. Look at me on the shelf. Yes, that's right. The ugly worn out book. Come on, pick me up. Is anybody else hearing this? Nope, I am the only speaking to you. Look, I don't even have a cover. Nobody will know you read me. I can't believe I'm doing this or hearing this. That's the miracle of the spirit. You have a hard time believing it's real. 
picks up the Bible. You're really speaking to me. I mean, how is this happening? It must be a ghost. End of scene. Fall monologue exercise by Jason Hucker. The character is Timmy, a nine-year-old boy, happy. Setting is a family dining room table. And at rise, the family holds hands around the Thanksgiving dinner. Um, I'm thankful that I got to um, go camping and roast marshmallows. Oh, um, in that time, I let the marshmallow get cool so I didn't burn my mouth. Um, I was going to swim in the river, but it was too cold. So I just put my feet in and skipped rocks. That was fun. I got four skips. That was the most ever. I found the coolest rock. It had like um, every color ever in it. I think it was a space rock or a comet. Anyway, m maybe it's one of those rocks that gives superpowers um, or makes me a mutant. Um, uh, I don't. I don't want an octopus arms. Oh, 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 oh yeah. Um, I'm thankful for grandma's pumpkin pie and, and for family. End of monologue. <laughs> so this is a monologue by Orlando Miles. The character is a 19 year old boy. The setting is he's waiting for his longtime girlfriend, Pam, underneath a naked tree. He's pacing back and forth at rise. Oh my God, what am I doing? I think it might be too soon or maybe it might, or, more, or maybe she might say no and leave me. Do she even really love me? I'm going off to college, so we're going to be away for each, from each other. She might grow tired of me not being around, but I can always fly back and visit her. I'm just thinking too much. Oh my God, here she comes. Okay, I'm going to say hi and tell her how much I love her. And no matter how far apart we are, we're still going to be one. Then I'm going to get on one knee and ask her to marry me. End of monologue. Fall monologue by Anonymous. Oh, how I long to walk out in the fog. The smell of the fog mixed with the smell of wet leaves. The, the smoke of burning trash takes me back to a time of youthful days. Out in the sticks of Wisconsin where one would look at the tree lines and see multiple, multitude of colors of dying leaves and be joyful walking in the woods not yet cold and no longer hot from the summer heat. The memories of these seasons bring me back days of lost harvest where my tribe would cook a lot of food and we had powwows. The dancers would dance to the beat of our earth drum. We had joyful days because all the work was done to prepare for winter the aroma of many foods. Cooking is like no other. Different pies cook and cooling. Turkey, duck, peasant, chicken, red deer, beaver, otter, rabbit, pig, goat, cows, and different fish all cooking at the same time outside. The sound of joy in the air. This is what so, this is the fall season brings to my soul. The memories of past days of useful memories. A childhood that I long to return to. End of monologue. This is a 10 minute play by James Daniel Nelson. Scene one, the characters are Natasha Romanoff 12 years old, fun-loving, loyal, and protective, and Jake Harris, a 12-year-old boy, adventurous. Setting is a playground at sunset, and at rise, Jake and Natasha are sitting on the swing set. 
<sighs> this sure is boring around here. Well, if you're bored, we can go adventuring. Where would you hope to find an adventure around here? Nothing interesting ever happens around here. We could go to the old abandoned amusement park. Why would you want to go to that creepy place? To see the vampires, of course. That sounds scary. Not really. Sure it does. Why? I mean, you're so strong and adventurous. Vampires. Chicken. <laughs> I thought you didn't believe in them. I'm not chicken. I just don't want to run into some vet job that believes he's an actual vampire. I think you're just scared. No, I'm not. You're just crazy. <laughs> Why am I crazy? Just because I want to see vampires? You don't even believe in them. I don't believe in actual vampires, but people that do are crazy. Especially the idiots that believe they are vampires. Vampires are real. If they are real, why hasn't anyone ever seen one? <laughs> because they hide themselves. <laughs> sure they do. Come on, I'll show you. Okay. Come on. I'm coming. Hurry up. End of scene one. Scene two, the same characters. The setting is now an old abandoned amusement park later that same night. At rise, Jake and Natasha are walking around the park. This is not what I expected. It's kind of scary. That's what I've been telling you. Here, take these. She hands Jake a flashlight and a wooden stake. What is the stake for? He turns on the flashlight. Vampires, of course. Remember, I told you there's supposed to be a nest of them here. Do you really believe we'll run into a vampire? You never know. This park is supposed to be full of them. Sure, there's a nest of them. Think about it really for a minute. Someone would have seen them. Not necessarily. They hide themselves from us as much as possible. Just like werewolves hide themselves. So you believe in both vampires and werewolves? I sure do. Don't worry if we run into a vampire though. I'll protect you. Well, I don't believe in either of them. <laughs> I don't care. I don't think they care if you believe in them or not. To a vampire, you're simply dinner. For that belief, it's not required. Why, why don't you have a flashlight? I can see just fine with the light from yours. Besides, if I, if I gotta protect you, I don't wanna leave anything in my hands. Did you, did you hear that? <sighs> of course I heard it. As a vampire, I have excellent hearing. I can even hear your heart beating faster right now. End of scene two. Scene three, we have the same characters. It's later that night around 11 p.m. And at rise, Jake and Natasha are sitting on the Ferris wheel. How come you never told me you were a vampire? And what was the big dog thing that attacked us? I'm not supposed to tell anyone because humans are dangerous. The dog thing was a lie camp, what you call a werewolf. What do you mean humans are dangerous? Your kind are the ones that kill people and suck their blood, not us. Well, humans seek to destroy what they don't understand. Then when it comes to us, humans either want to kill us or have us and turn them into vampires. Can you turn someone into a vampire? <laughs> of course not. That's pure fiction. As is the whole undead part too. I am your best friend. You could have trusted me. I won't tell anyone. So what now? I wanted you to know my secret and meet my family. I wasn't expecting a lie can attack though. I hope we can still be friends. 
We are definitely still friends. Why did the werewolf attack us? Ever since our people arrived here on Terra, we've been at war with the Latin hands. They see themselves as the protectors of the natural order on this planet. As such, they see us as abominations because we came from another planet thousands of years ago. You mean vampires are aliens too? <laughs> yeah, I guess we are aliens. <laughs> we migrated to this planet a long time ago. We call it the Great Migration. I'll tell you all about that later though. All right. It's late, so better get some sleep. Okay, I'm tired. End of play. An Object in a Specific Setting Scene by Anonymous. The characters are Robert and the phone. The setting is in the day room. It is 7.30 p.m. on a Monday. At rise, Robert is looking at his watch. Oh, damn, it's 7.30. I got to call home. Hey, what's going on? Bossy, uh, how's that happen? Well, Smarty, it means that someone is on the phone where you're calling. Huh? Are you talking to me? <laughs> no, I'm talking to the wall, fool. Yeah, I'm talking to you. Why are you talking to me? Is this the operator? Uh, hello? Who are you? What's your name and... What do you want? Well, first, I'm not the operator. I'm the phone. I'm talking to you because I'm tired of being mistreated all the time. It's people like you that make my days long and tiring. I just got on this phone. I ain't doing anything. Look, buddy, I've heard every call you've ever made and and. And I felt every pain you caused me by yelling and telling, like slamming the cord, slamming the phone, pressing all the buttons all hard and just being an all around jerk to me. Wait, wait, wait. How the heck am I supposed to know I'm doing something wrong to you? You're a phone. Who thinks about a damn phone? You do. Every time you want to call your family. You don't care about no one else but yourself. But let the phone, but the phone not work. You'll be all ready to get a new phone. New one, fool. You act like a fool. Who messed up the phone? Who sprayed the phone? Who, who, who pulled the cord? Look. Yeah, but you're a phone. You got one job to do. Call other phones. Keep mistreating us, and it will be like every time, every other time in life, you mistreated. Nothing will be there for you. you show you care and keep everything. Learn from your mistakes. You're sorry. The number you called is no longer in service. If you fell, you've reached this number in error. Please make up, please hang up and try again. End of scene. A comedy scene by Anonymous. The characters are Jose, elder, 70 year old male, mellow, nothing but a person passing, and Robert, a young man, 26 male, hyper, nothing but a person passing. The setting is in the park, sitting on a bench in the early evening. At rise, both are in conversation about the sunset. So many different sunsets my eyes have seen in my life. The memories I have are wonderful. What makes them so special? They're just the sun going down. That's nothing. <laughs> when you are my age, you start to remember all the great things that happened in your life. 
So sunsets were the great things in your life? I never said that the sunsets were the great things in my life. I said my eyes have seen many different ones and they bring back memories. Okay, so memories, not sunsets. What kind of memories? Oh, well, in my youth, I was unable to enjoy the sunsets. In middle age, I was able to view a setting sun on this bench with different people every night. Wait, how come you weren't able to enjoy a sunset in your youth? Because there are people like myself who cannot have sunlight touch them. It feels like you're burning and your eyes hurt and start to water. Oh, I've heard of that. It's a real rare disease. Yes. The curse of the undead. The life of a vampire. Happy Halloween. <laughs> no! Monologue. I am by Edward Garza. I am a shark. My arrogance knows no bounds. My justification is the violent bite of my many teeth. All creatures fear me and my appetite, a smell of blood a mile away. The ocean embraces me as a firstborn son. What I don't like, I spit out. My taste is like that of a gastronomist connoisseur. I enjoy the taste of all countries, you know, to break up my palate. I'm also a movie star. <laughs> You're gonna need a bigger boat. End of monologue. Autumn Inspired Scene by Edward Garza. The characters are Grandpa Jeb, 80 years old veteran, conservative, narrow-minded, and Shane, 19 year old college student, left-wing politics grandson. The setting, it is fall, sitting on a park bench in the morning. At rise, they watch urban kids arguing over a basketball game. Never like the way they act and dress. Why all the hysterics over a foul? It was a foul, I could see it from here. Oh, them Puerto Ricans and blacks can get loud. Oh. Why can't they just be kids? When kids are having a good time, they get loud. Maybe they, they ought to be working. Hmm. What, what are you going to learn from screaming and hollering on a Sunday morning? I, it says a lot for their parents who don't have them in church. We're not in church. Well, I, I was never much for sitting in the front pews of feeling guilty. Uh, uh, I think God has bigger fish to fry than worrying over my pacemaker. You know the world's changing. I believe it's for the better. I believe my generation will rewrite the history books. Put in what was left out. Oh, you never liked John Wayne. To be honest, I always lean towards Henry Fonda. <laughs> it's all for the truth, son. What, what I'm seeing now is, is your world. It's everyone's world. You and I, Grandpa Jeb, have been setting the example. Once a week, we watch one of your favorite movies and then mine. Yeah, I, I did like that fella killing all the zombies until he was the last one standing. I, I used to think we did right dropping the atomic bombs even to save just one American life. It's always old people who send the young to war. That's what all the noise is about. We wanna change that. 
Remember how you felt when those old words you know as a kid was gone? Yeah, built, built right over all of it they did. Didn't recognize a darn thing. Well, this afternoon we'll be marching. Good thing you saved them two World War II gas masks. You know what to do the last time helping those kids. I never knew that side of you. End of scene. A Conversation Between Good and Evil by Daniel Cohen. Scene one, evil, a manifestation of all human evil, appears as a human, and good, a manifestation of all human good, appears as a human. The setting, an office setting, both are sitting down. At rise, the two parties discussing humankind and who will win them over. You are such a blind optimist and a naive spirit to think you could ever win against evil. I don't agree. In time, good will win. Granted, you have the numbers, but your victory is only temporary. Evil drains people of their life force. Eventually, they will come to my side. You really believe that, don't you? That is why it is your fate to lose. I am the victor in this war. I always will be. You win little battles. I win the war. I am the darkest corners of men's souls. I am the black spindle inside the spine of humankind. The majority is good. Some may be swayed by your evil ways, but most will recoil at what you bring. <laughs> My dear fool, I am the majority. That is why we always win. Not always. You only think you're on the right side, but every human you pick is eventually overthrown by good. Good destroys evil in time. Your time is running out. This world is mine. Real life isn't some Hollywood movie where the hero wins and gets the girl in the end. In real life, at the end of the movie, the hero dies. Not always. Always, in one way or another. I always win. You cannot defeat what is in the hearts of men. I, I refuse to accept that. You don't have to accept what's real. You can refuse it. That's part of your obnoxious free choice. Why do you hate humanity? It's not a question of hate. It's a question of what's to like. Th there, there's a lot to like. Empathy, kindness, Redemption, self-sacrifice, an unbreakable spirit, puppies. I, I, I mean, have you seen puppies? Adorable. If I ate, I would eat puppies. Everything about the world that you love makes me ill. I don't see what you see. I see betrayal, greed, cruelty, revenge, those who inflict misery on others for enjoyment. You only see one side of things, your side. There's a lot more to humanity than the vile side. Why can't you just give humans a chance? Why should I? Humans were given a chance. They proved to only foster fear, a culture that fosters Fear of self and of each other is doomed to extinction. It's not all fear of self and each other. They, they are learning to accept themselves and each other. It's a process. It takes time. Look how far they've grown from animals. And yet, after thousands of years to get it right, genocides continue. You can't measure the whole of human progress off your side only. What would make you assume that I would play fair? You should know better. I, I, can, I can prove it, that humanity 
is worth saving and, and good prevails. Doubt it, but go ahead and try. Consider this, with all the pain and, and misery you fostered through the millennia, how is it that people still smile, still laugh and enjoy each other's company and, and get along? despite your best efforts to make them do the opposite. That is a good point, actually. It's something I've considered on and off throughout the years, but it's not something I like to think about. Why not? If your theory proves to be true, then my theory is flawed. What would be so bad about that? It would mean I've wasted my entire life fostering misery. Everyone makes mistakes. You can always redeem yourself. Redemption? Me? <laughs> you can't be serious. I am. At what cost? I would destroy myself. Self-sacrifice. Good things can come of it. Like what? You, you never know what good things may come of it. Being human... You just need to have the courage to try and do good. But I'm not human. If you're even thinking about this, you have the capacity to be human. What about the chaos? It, it'll always be there with or without you. Without balance, the world would collapse. Evil isn't balance, evil is malice. Things will still live and die, eat and kill to survive, but not kill for enjoyment. So what would you have me do? It, it, it's not something terribly hard. You just have to give up doing evil and try to do good. You may fail sometimes, but... The fact that you're trying is good enough. This whole thing is a horrifying prospect for me, you know? What if I fall back into my old ways? Backsliding happens, but you can always make the choice to get back on the good path. Everyone falls off now and then. I honestly don't think I have the strength to be good. Just try it. You would be surprised how much easier it is. If I agree to do this thing, you've got to have my back. I will. I will. I promise. It's hard to let go of what I am. It's not what you are. It's what you've been. To me, it's the same thing. But it's not. Your actions in the past don't need to define who you are in the present or who you will become into the future. You really think so? I know so. The humans had a saying long ago. They said, if you want to be free, all you have to do is let go. All right. Hmm. I let go. I renounce evil in all its forms. Malice, hate, racism, sexism, homophobia, classism, and everything else that tears humanity to pieces. I'm proud of you. I feel different. I thought I'd be destroyed for switching sides, but instead I, I feel happy. Hungry. Wait, why am I hungry? Spirits in human form don't get hungry unless you're human now. The balance. It wasn't destroyed. I suppose I should think up a new name since the old me is gone. End of play.
12 line scene with an object by Edward Garza. Characters, oblivion and creation, man. Setting, man's first steps on earth. At rise, creation is staring at the moon. It has no permanence. Nothing your eyes behold can you grasp. To me, even you are sand. Don't try to make sense of it, sense of it. It's all greater than you. Why do I get the feeling that you exist as my detractor? <laughs> you are the interloper here. I have but one purpose. There's no meaning to the mire. Yet you will stand on the parapet and avoid passing judgments. What I think has garnered, garnered all things that ever were and ever, ever will be. That celestial object proves itself stronger than you. Tell me, which has more relevance? All things must come to acknowledge me. What can such powerless infants of creation like you do to top that? I tolerate you and a moment and then you snap my fingers, be gone. I fully acknowledge your right to purpose, but from what I see, it's all afresh once you have your say. <laughs> oh, oh, I was told to be wary of you. There are whispers of you before your, your arrival. You are not satisfied with one purpose like the rest of us. You'll get used to it. If I begin to sing, to weep, or even to pray, what does that offend you? We have lived peacefully in our cosmos bowl and suddenly you proclaim creation and to, is new and something incomprehensible. We exist without mercy. We ask for nothing. I am a song that can't be silenced. That's the purpose I have chosen here. Bring your sorrow, call your storms. I ask for everything. What, what you contemplate is sheer madness. Never could we have, have uh, imagined the brilliance uh, you attribute to the formless, boundless highways. Who are you? I am the poet. End of scene. Professor Gerbelmuncher on the Art of Spilling Coffee by <laughs> Daniel Cohen. <clears throat> As a grand master spiller of general liquids in general, I'm so great at this, I am great at everything, always. So to start, make sure your lid is not secure and be sure to constantly refill your cup post-spill with scalding hot liquid of coffee variety. Mm. I have at least thermoses on me at all times. Now, in addition to whatever I was saying, you can also not use a lid at all, which makes it easier to spill coffee on yourself and others. <laughs> oh, I recall my first, I recall meeting my first, third and fifth wife, wife and wife this way. I met the other three whilst pursuing my triple doctrine, the art of spilling coffee, the philosophy of being annoying, and by far my most useless degree, political science. I met my final wife while finishing my degree in how to lose friends and alienate people, which served as inspiration for the punk band Screeching Weasel's landmark album how to lose friends and alienate people. I remember the, the time I met the lead singer, Ben Weasel. I spilled coffee on him and he slapped my face in which is how often my relationships begin and end. <laughs> now, on to the history of coffee spills. End of monologue. Scene, an object in a specific setting by James Daniel Nelson. 
The characters are Danny, a 22-year-old inmate, and Cage, a holding cage in ADSEG. The setting is ADSEG at 9 a.m. And at rise, Danny is sitting inside Cage. This is stupid. I'm in the hole again. When will I learn to keep my mouth shut? Probably when you learn how to control your anger. Who, who said that? I did. I'm the cage, the one you're in right now. And while normally I don't talk to humans, you seem to need some help. I don't need your help. You're a cage. Yeah, yeah, I'm a cage. One you've been in five times in six months. You've been angry every time you come to add SIG. So why are you so mad? I'm not telling you. You're a cage. Who better to talk to than something that normally does not speak to people? You, you might be onto something. Yeah. Oh, okay, cage. I'll, I'll give it a shot. All right, that's the spirit now. Lay it on me. What? My mom died of cancer. And I could have been there for her, but, but I've come to realize that my actions told her my reputation was more important to me than she was. Because I kept getting into trouble here. I'm sorry to hear of your loss. Try to remember that your mother knew you and that you loved her. Even your actions didn't exactly seem, you know, scream that to her. She knew anyway. Now, you can try to live for yourself in a manner that you think she'd approve of, knowing she's no longer in pain. End of scene. Autumn inspired scene by James Daniel Nelson. The characters are Hank, a deformed pumpkin, tall and narrow, depressed, and Sam, a fat jack-o'-lantern, good natured and happy. The setting is fall, October 20th, early evening, and at rise, Sam is sitting on a fence post talking with Hank. <clears throat> Looks like no one wants a deformed pumpkin. Oh, don't worry. There's still people, some people looking around. Stay cheerful and you'll get picked. I just want to be a jack-o'-lantern like you. Tomorrow's Halloween, so if I don't get picked tonight, I won't make it. Yeah, I know it's not easy being skinny and tall when you should be short and fat. <laughs> uh, but there's still people looking around. I can see a little boy and little girl coming this way. Really? I can't see that direction. They're here. Sam, I'm being picked up. I'm getting picked. Oh, goodbye, my friend. <laughs> Scare some kids for me. I will, I will. <laughs> well, at least Hank finally got picked. Better late than never. I guess. End of scene. <laughs> Monologue exercise, I am, by Richard Bassett. I am a bird. I feel like a cage bird. I fly when, my, when I'm out of the cage. I feel free to soar with my wings spread out, overjoyed by the sense of freedom. I find my favorite water hole and enjoy my bird bath. Then I fly back to my cage and enjoy a tasty meal, longing for the day to end and start again to repeat the process. I am a bird. All I see is respectful. Flying is my passion. My greatest fear is not having the freedom to fly. End of monologue. The Thoughts of Jack the Snake by Matthew Jacobs. The Thoughts of Jack the Snake. S this morning, I'm taking a nicest little nap. 
when all of a sudden this jerk I'm living with slides open the door to my bedroom and says, hey, buddy, it's like any normal snake. I jump back away from the door, right? He cackles like a madman and slides the other side open, pinches my little and pulls me out. Next thing I know, I'm hanging by my tail on his pinky for my scales. Then he throws me his rack. And that metal is so freaking cold. I'm cold blooded, but geez, I can't wait till I'm large enough to swallow him whole. End of monologue. 12 Lines Seen with an Object by Matthew Jacobs. The characters are Snake and White Rock. The setting, midday in Jack's box. At rise, Jack is curled up on his rock on the box. Ah, finally, relaxation. I might just uh, doze off, hope no one bothers me. Whoa, ho, 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 hey, Jack. If you're gonna get real comfortable, mind going to the corner? But the box is cracked right here. I'm enjoying the breeze. What's the problem? Well, you know what happens when you start feeling safe and comfortable. What? I can't make myself at home? What's the problem? Well, last time, you pooped on me. Yes, so what's the problem? Who doesn't poop in their house? Safe and comfy. I mean, you want me to poop out in the streets when I'm on the slide? I, I mean, man, bro, you don't drop one on me. I mean, it's it's not like, like you're never going to put you outside the box. Huh. How else am I s supposed to decorate? Besides, when I'm out there, I'm slithering for my life oh come on those guys love you and care for you like like they're you're their their baby poop on their beds or something they provide a maid service anyways and i would poop on their beds i I'll feel safe in there but i'm not trying to get flushed down the toilet yeah, <laughs> I guess you got to protect yourself. I don't think they do it on purpose, but they are clumsy, aren't they? End of scene. Craig the Gecko by Andre. I am Craig the Gecko. I come from a small island. It is so beautiful there. Oh. There, the waters are so clear and beautiful. I can see vast amounts of fish and other sea life without any obstruction. Ah, oh, don't, don't get me wrong. I love where I live now, yet it's not the same. I get restless sometimes and where I want to visit some of my family, but they have moved away. And some have passed on. So I made journey all that way, only to be looking for people who are no longer there. And that would be sad. <laughs> oh. Hello? This is him. Hey, I was just thinking of you and considering a visit. Yes, that's great. I will see you. Take care. End of monologue.
Scene, an object in a specific setting by Andre. Characters, Charlie, the wall phone, and the clock. The setting is in the day room. At Rise, two people are debating about their phone time in the day room. Wow, here we go again. Another dispute over me. I guess it's nice to be wanted, yet this is getting to be too much work. Well, at least you're talked to. People just look at me. Sometimes they, they forget me. I mean, I use my hands all day and they get tired. I mean, sometimes the conversations can be nice and loving and other times they're just shouting between the two you know then i end up getting slammed and stretched out and all kind of stuff yeah yeah i mean i may be at, at the end of the range but of that but i've been dropped and they forget to fix my my or my batteries uh, causing my hands to get stuck i wish i could get a makeover you know, they can get some fancy stuff with us. Like, I heard my cousin in the other building over there, <clears throat> he has seen where, you know, they can help people, you know, talk to each other, like, face-to-face. -face. It's so cool. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That is cool. <laughs> They're adding stuff to us to uh, being able to tell what, what, what the temperature is. And I can tell different times all over the world. Ah, oh, man, here we go again. Here we go, look. These two about to go to blows. Oh, that punch looked that, oh, like that hurt, oh. Yeah, that blast alarm will be sounding shortly. Oh, wait, it's, uh, it's about to break it. Uh, that's cool. I really did feel like seeing that blue flashing light because my hands are, are stuck straight and I can't cover my eyes. I understand, see, my eyes are sensitive. So I'm super glad that, you know, that nice guy broke it up before that happened. Well, I'll talk to you later, man. Hey, wait, I might be able to get an upgrade. I hear something, maybe that the next time we can, we can brag about our improvements. Gotta go. Like, this guy is always calling his family, and there's always conversations full of things that, you know, make my days full of joy and, and, and so great. <laughs> yeah. yeah. You too. It, it was fun talking to you. End of scene. Autumn inspired scene by Herbert Miller. The characters are Sassy, an 80-year-old female, traditional, and Luca, 75-year-old male, liberal. The setting is fall in a park, 4 p.m., feeding the ducks. At rise, Sassy is approaching Luca because he has all the ducks. Hello. What do you have that makes all the ducks want to give you their company? Oh, oh, these old ducks got a liking to my singing. That's all. The name is Luca. Would you mind giving us your company? I don't mind. My name is Sussy. I just moved into this community from Montana and marveled that the ducks haven't flew south yet. <laughs> Were you not listening, Miss Sussy? I told you they like my singing. <laughs> I thought you were pulling my leg, Luca. <laughs> now, why would I do a thing like that? <laughs> you emit such a warm, beautiful sound, Luca. Uh -oh. I'm impressed. Oh, thank you. All the glory to the one and only God. <laughs> my life is my life is from him and my life will go back to him. Are you a Christian, Luca? 
Uh, no, I, I, I believe I'm, I'm just a man who, who loves all God's creatures and, and I love all my neighbors and, and uh, don't think much more into anything else. It's so strange meeting a stranger that makes autumn so wonderful. Do you stay close by? Uh, I suppose I do, Sussy. I live here in this park. Sussy, dear, why are you rigid? Uh, I seem distressed. My children didn't want me to move into this urban community. And if I'm honest, I wasn't sure if I should myself. I come from traditional lineage. Oh, it's okay. But don't worry, I'm not gonna ask for nothing or, or harm you. No, no, Luca, I'm sorry. It's just for so many years, I trained myself to make certain things and environments invisible. My heart is aching, but I can't put my finger on why. Oh, oh I, I see. You're, you're a beautiful, elegant woman. Uh, don't worry. Don't worry one click about me. Um, I'm tough like that. I'm, I'm tough like that old tree right there. Luca, you're not making me feel better. Sassy, you're like those angels with wings. Come tomorrow and we'll feed the ducks. Ba dum ba bum ba dum bum bum ba da da bum ba dum bum bum ba da bum ba dum bum 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 bum. End of scene. A monologue, Netta Nevers, by Herbert Miller. Every time this food takes me out, I always order a salad. And the places we go always give me this prefixed plastic container dressing in the packet kit, and I've never eat it all. I mean, you you would think after two years he would get the point. I was supposed to yesterday where he was going to take me some. If he was going to take me somewhere, I would enjoy some nice food with a fresh salad, hoping he would get there. But this waste of time seriously believed as long as it's sealed and from the vending machine it's fresh <laughs> and then when i told him i wanted a steak ready he blindfolded me for a surprise and drove me to carl's jr for the new steak burger promoted you know the the worst part of it the story is it because I developed feelings for him. When he asked a bite, I, I actually liked it. <laughs> I mean, if you can't beat him, join him. End of monologue. Scene one by Mikhail Webb. The characters are Domino, mid-30s, male, funny, humble, and loyal, and Azalea, around the same age, female, friendly, beautiful, and smart. The setting is the bleachers at a crowded park, lit up by the sunlight in the mid-afternoon hour. There's action on the soccer field and playgrounds, controlled by kids who are running around and the birds are singing off key. At rise, Azalea is sitting on the bleachers with her face resting in both hands as Domino stops his jog once he spots Azalea and approaches her, concerned about her posture. Leah, what's going on girl? I tried to get a hold of you to see if, if you wanted to join me for a job. Just needed some alone time to gather my thoughts and get some fresh air. Sorry I didn't return your text. I haven't returned anyone's if it makes you feel better. How would that make me feel better? If anything, it makes me feel worse knowing that my beautiful best friend feels like that. 
Not yeah. another kid who just fell off with a sling. Look at him. He looks lost, confused, and dizzy. Talk to me, little mama. What's going on? I don't know. I just, I just don't feel, you know, I got issues, boy. I'm just, uh, I'm stuck in my head today. He stands over Azalea and acts as if he's trying to pry open her head. Mom, what are you doing? You said you were stuck in your head. I was just trying to get you out of it. <laughs> all right, all right. It's Chris. The way he acts around me, he doesn't seem as into me as I am to him. And I don't know, I keep asking myself, what am I doing wrong? Is there another girl? Dom, do you think there's someone else? Absolutely not. Chris isn't that stupid. You two just got together and nothing is wrong with you. You are perfect. You got that long curly hair that brushes up against those eyes that seem to invite one to paradise. You possess one of those smiles that make everything else fade away. It's contagious, and you're a blast to be around. You are smart, down to earth, and you're worth everything that's, that's beautiful in this world because it must have been because of you. Wow. Dom, you, you always have just the words to break a girl out of her slump. Eyes that invite one to paradise? Why can't Chris make me feel special like you do? Azalea, the words come naturally because everything is just said holds truth. And maybe Chris doesn't know how to express himself and knows, but he knows he loves you. <laughs> oh yeah? How do you know he loves me, Dom? <laughs> Why does he always find an excuse to not be around me when things seem to be going just fine? Look, Leah, I've known Chris for years, and being with you, he's changed. I can honestly tell you, there's nobody else that, that if he's cheating, and maybe he doesn't want to mess things up, and when they're going good like he did last time. Domino, I, I'm in love with Chris, and, and I've forgiven him. I want to spend the rest of my life with that man. I'm giving him my entire heart. I just want him to give me all of his. Is that so much to ask for? The rest of your life? Leah, I'm going to have a talk with him and pound some sense into his head. You shouldn't be feeling the way that you do. Thank you, Dom. You're the best. I'll always be here for you, Azalea for the rest of my life. How about that jog? Let's do it. The two jog off, end of scene. Monologue by Mikhail Webb. I know that I'm supposed to have holiday cheer, but it's kind of hard with all these dead leaves Gray clouds, God, I hope it doesn't rain. Is baseball playoff time and my Padres are in it for the first time in 14 years, making them not during this cold weather? This time of year, fam bam is close as they pile up in the kitchen, creating all types of aromas from turkey, chitlins, and candy yams and all kind of pies. I'm more of a loner though, who loves adventure in the city. But I hate the short days, daylight swing times. Out of nowhere, I find myself stuck deep in thought on my front porch as rain drops begin to fall. White water drenches, my hoodie sweats, my sweatshirt. Instead of running for the shelter, I stand frozen as I lock eyes with an officer 
in his patrol car, strolling down the street slowly. The faces of Breonna Taylor, George Floyd, flashing before my eyes. The thought floods my head. Damn, am I next? As the rain floods my limbs, I hear mom's voice. No sudden move, son. The cop rolls his window down and smiles, saying, happy holidays. I flash a nervous smile. And I nod my head of return wishes. Relieved, I join my family and tell them all I love them. At the same time, I thank the Lord for allowing me to love something that countless black men and women has stolen from them. For being black, I'm gonna muster up some holiday cheer while I'm blessed to be able to. Happy holidays. End of monologue. Twelve line scene with an object by Herbert Miller. Characters, King of Heart playing card and the Jack of Heart playing card. Setting, 2 a.m. Hustles Casino in Gardena, California. At rise, a five card draw has been dealt with three hearts, the king, jack, and a seven of hearts. Hey Jack, how's it going? Hmm. Oh, not much. You think we got something here? Look, there's the seven of hearts. Uh, I'm the king of hearts. What can a seven do for me? Do you, you do know that I am the top card in the deck, don't you? The game we are now playing is five card draw. And with the seven, we only have two to draw. Get rid of the diamond and the club and draw two more hearts. We? What do you mean we? I alone am important. Why on Hoyle's earth should I not go and search for my brothers, the three other kings? But king. I may be better if the hearts, as a family, have the goal and win in this one hand. No, you don't understand about what I'm already, I'm already powerful because I was created powerful. I only want to associate with power as any other king would do. Oh, maybe you can't understand. Well, I'm a jack of heart. And that makes me higher than nine other cards. So I get entitlement. No, no, you don't. You're higher than 10 other cards. Don't you know how to bloody count? Wait, there's the twos, the threes, the fours, the fives, the sixes, the sevens, the eights, the nines, the tens. And then me, in my position. Oh, you jack of lantern. You didn't count the blasted ace. The ace is the one you can count to. I am the highest card. O-M-G. You want attention so bad, you will demean the ace of heart? This is rubbish. And we are playing five card draw. You can exchange my support and look for kings. You simply don't play fair. End of scene. Improv scene by Mikhail Webb. The characters are Susan, a 27-year-old lady who loves to joke around with her friends, Jolene's best friend since grade school. And Jolene, 27 as well. She's more goal-oriented and serious. She and Susan are inseparable. The setting, a local Albertsons late in the afternoon. It's Thanksgiving Eve. Eve, at rise, Susan and Jolene are standing in an aisle, making last minute purchases and discussing Susan being pregnant. Yes, girl, I did tell him, finally. <laughs> 
<laughs> oh, really now? How did he take it? Well, Greg took it like a little baby. Skyball and die his nose, crying and going on and on. The man dropped to his knees. And it, th this thought blessed my mind. I might not even want this baby. Oh my God, Susan, stop being dramatic. People express joy in many different ways. Oh, no, Joe. It wasn't joy he was expressing. I need Greg. After I told him I was pregnant. Why in the world would you do a thing like that? Because he got me pregnant. Turkey day is tomorrow, you know, in a couple more months. I'm gonna be the turkey. <laughs> Susan, it, it won't be that bad. I'm gonna be by your side the whole way. And so will Greg, I'm sure of it. Oh, oh he, he has no choice. I took both of his credit cards before warning him about, you know, making them, maxing them suckers out, if he leaves me, you know, you know. <laughs> As a matter of fact, digs through her pull purse and pulls one out. As a matter of fact, we are gonna get the rest of this stuff with this one. Uh, <laughs> man, Susan, you are something else. She pulls out her shopping list. Okay. What have we here? Girl, you know what? We're gonna max this out right. And to let him know I'm serious. She swipes an entire shelf into her cart. Come on, girl. Let's go. End of play. A play by Mikhail Webb and Roy Ayala. Scene one. Characters are Marcy, an in-shape 29-year-old independent go-getter. She's Latina and very in touch with her heritage. And Darcy, Marcy's neighbor. She's a 35 single mother of two who's also Latina and very independent. It's 9.45 a.m. and the two ladies are in the living room of Darcy's house. The aroma of coffee fills the place and the blinds are open to encourage the beginning of the day. At rise, the two are sitting on the couch, drawing up separate posters on the table in front of them as they discuss the day's events and watch TV on low volume. You know, girl, I did not think you were coming over after what happened yesterday. I'd be lying to you if I told you I didn't hit the snooze button twice while having second thoughts about this whole thing. You hit the snooze twice? I should be so lucky. Having a three-year-old and a 14-month-old are like having alarm clocks going off hourly. But hey, what me and you are choosing to be a part of is bigger than the both of us. And any type of strife that we fall face will be well worth the outcome. Darcy, do you know how many times I had to wash my hair to get the smell of tear gas smoke out? I mean, it, it's not even our problem. Um, three times because I had to get the smell out of my hair as well. And not our problem, Marcy. It's the whole world's problem, Ma. What are you talking about? Girl, I get criticized when I say all lives matter because I believe we matter too. And five times. What five times? My hair, I had to wash it five times. What kind of shampoo are you using? <sighs> but that's beside the point, Ma. And we indeed matter, Marcy. It's just their time right now. We need all of the support that's available in the entire world. What's going on right now is absolutely ludicrous and it needs to stop. If we're not being a part of the solution, we're the problem, period. Really? Where was everybody, where was everybody at when America was taking a portion of our country away? Not only did it happen, but that wall was enforced just years ago. And, and, and we're being murdered as well. Do brown lives not matter? Please explain this logic. Mija, 
I'm almost positive that during the Spanish American War, African Americans were trying to escape slavery, some even fleeing to Mexico. And the dreamers will rise again. It's, it's just their time right now, Marcy. I mean, the way George Floyd was murdered in cold blood was the tipping point. Breonna Taylor was asleep in her house in her bed by the law enforcement. Could have easily been us. I just feel underappreciated. I, I, I want respect gained from the marching and, and the shouting. I don't think I'm gaining anything for this. Baby doll, it may not seem that us as Latinas, we are gaining anything from this movement, but trust me, mija, sooner rather than later, you will feel the respect and appreciation. V O five. V O, huh? V O five. That's what kind of shampoo I use. <laughs> Gotta step your game up, girl. But trust me on this, okay? End of scene. Scene two, we have Marcy and Darcy and an old black man and his granddaughter. The setting is a park under a cloudless sky. It's 2.30 and little birds are chirping like crazy. The sun is bright and the wind is low. One week later. At rise, the two are taking a break from the protesting, gathering their thoughts and resting and conversing at a park table. Oh, it's a hot one today, girl. And can you believe that during all of that tension out there, the, the shouting, the sweating, just the seriousness of this situation, that those guys tried to shoot their shot? <laughs> I couldn't even believe it. I don't know what you're so shocked about. You're the one with everything hanging all out. <laughs> <laughs> hmm. So are you starting to see the big picture? To be honest, Dee, I'm still where I was when I expressed where my head was at about the whole situation. Really? Yeah, I mean, that huge group of us protesting and marching, I don't see how little old me is making any difference besides being eye candy to those two jokers. Hey, forget about those two guys. Hermosa, you have to know your worth in order to be worth something, in order to matter. Marcy, know that you matter. It's not that I don't know my worth. It's just that when the crowd disperses and goes home, nobody even notices that I was there, you know? And why are you so passionate about this, Ma? I mean, you even hire a babysitter for the little ones. Why do you do it? I do it because it's the right thing to do, Marcy. I do it because I would want somebody to do it for me. I do it because I matter. We matter, baby girl. You know, there is so much wisdom that comes out of you when you try to talk smart. <laughs> You're a special person, Dee. I love you, girl. I love you too, Marcy. And know that you're a special person as well. So special that I think those two guys followed us here. D, you smart and special and all that, but you need glasses, girl. That's an old man and some kid. <laughs> the two look at the two people approaching and share a chuckle. <laughs> it's a hot one, ain't it, ladies? You don't mind if we join you two for a little bit, do you? Oh, no, sir. Be our guest. Oh, you two are protesting with us? Yes, we are. We're only taking a breather and we're back out there. Oh my God, that is so new. You two ladies give me hope that the world can be a better place. I mean it, girls. It means more than you know, seeing you two out here. Sir. We would want people to be out there for us as well. We're supposed to be out there. Thank you. 
so yes. much, lady. I love you. End of scene. Scene three, Marcy and Darcy and the older man with his granddaughter. The setting is six months later. It's a quarter past 6 p.m. downtown San Diego in the middle of the street where traffic has stopped. It's dark out, but the street lights illuminate the scene brightly. At rise, Marcy and Darcy are in the middle of a protest against the building of an enhanced border wall. The marching is at a standstill. Bridges, no walls. When division rises, love falls. How you feeling? Liberated, empowered. My, my whole understanding of my self-worth has changed. And with that, my self-respect has risen. Now, when I meet a guy, I feel like I'm bringing something to the table other than my body. Why everything got to be about a guy with you? I was getting deep there for a minute. <laughs> You're going to be all right, girl. I hope. When division rises, love falls. Darcy, do you think racism and prejudice will ever go away? Sadly, Miha, no, I don't. What I do believe is that we are more united than we've been in a long time. Mm. Oh my God, Ma, look who it is. Granddaughter and older man appear holding signs. Bridges, no walls. End of play. Big Man, Little Man by Vassar Will Smith. We have Agustina Napolitana, a corpulent, highly emotional middle-aged woman. Luigi Vendetti, a rising mafia don. Dominic Stupino Malatesta, Luigi's low-level enforcer. Carlo Napolitano, Agustina's nine-year-old son and Luigi's favorite nephew. And Giovanni Johnny Calabrese, the 11 year old schoolyard bully. The setting is the hallway outside of the office where Uncle Louie regularly meets with colleagues and subordinates to discuss the family business. At Rise, Agostina storms onto the stage to get Louie to settle a crisis. Luigi, Luigi, we need your help. You gotta come out right now. Louie comes out and meets her in the hall. Come te, me sorore. Come down, sister. What's the matter? Why you gotta interrupt my meeting with the Pisani? We discussing some important business. Scusa mio, fratre, but this is no wait. Carletto, your favorite nephew, he's got a big trouble right now. There's a Familia Nova on the block, the Calabresis, and the Ragazzo Giovanni as well. A bully. Luigi, Luigi, the big bad Gianni, don't bomb my bambino. Sangue de Cristo. Sister, I'm about to become the next capo de tutti capi. And you call me out of important meaning to settle children's quarrel? Mia perdone, Luigi. But you know Carlo, he's a nice boy. And this Gianni, he's a bully. You got no respect for either little kids or grown ups. We got to do something about him. Okay, okay. But couldn't this have waited? I mean, me and the boys, we discussed an important business like collecting protection money, or paying off the cops, and fixing elections. I know, Luigi, but as you always say, la familia viene prima. We gotta protect Carlo from that big bad bully. Relax, sister, relax. I'll send Dominique, take Carlo, to school and bring him home. Meanwhile, 
he'll have a talk with this GI that ought to do the trick. Believe me, nobody messes with me, especially after Data had a talk with the Dominique. Mille grazie, Luigi. You're such a good brother and a fine uncle. Carlo looks up to you so much, I knew we could depend on you. End of scene one. Scene two, Dominic escorts Carlo to the schoolyard where Johnny is bouncing two balls, one soft, the other hard. Hey, kid, I wanna to talk to you. You did a bad thing when you hit Carlo. His uncle Louis is a bigger man in the La, La Organization. He don't like it when anyone screw with the little man. Oh yeah? Well, this is New York. Where, where they don't like for no big gorillas to hang no schools or threaten little kids. So take your bananas and get lost. Oh boy, you got a big mouth on you. If you was brought up white, right, you'd respect grown-ups, not mistreat nobody, especially smaller kids. Now listen up. I'm a warning you for the first and last time. Leave Carlo alone. Perlato is, is Uncle Louis's favorite nephew. And the Uncle Louis don't like for nobody to screw with the little man. Oh, I'm terrified. What are you gonna do? Breathe garlic on me? Oh, you ain't funny, kid. And this ain't no joking matter. Now, I've done told you, leave the little man alone or something very unfortunate could, unfortunate could happen to you, maybe your family too, huh? Go away, you big ape, and don't threaten me or my family. He beans Dominic on the head with the softball, knocking Dominic's hat off. I tried to tell you nice, but you didn't listen. You, you did a bad thing. The Uncle Louie is very important. He don't like for nobody to screw with the little man. Oh well, yeah, we'll take that. Before Dominic can pick up his derby from the ground, Johnny beans him on the head with the hardball. Oh, it ain't spring, but I'm here in Birdie's tweet. And it ain't night, but I'm I'm seeing stars. Listen, kid, I warned you, the Uncle Louie don't like for nobody to man with the little screw. Dominic falls down unconscious. End of scene two. Johnny and Carlo are staring at each other over the prone figure of Dominic, whom Johnny has just knocked out with a hard baseball. I'm sorry. I really am. I didn't mean to hurt him. I was only protecting myself. That didn't give you the right to kill him. Just hold on a minute. Let me check him out. He might not be dead. Maybe not even hurt that bad. Johnny briefly puts his ear to Dominic's chest and places several fingers briefly on Dominic's wrist. Good news. His pulse is strong and his breathing is regular. He'll probably come to in a few minutes and be just fine, except for maybe a headache. I got my first aid merit badge in Scouts, so I know about these things. Okay. But what about your hidden me and, and taking my lunch money yesterday? Look, I'm sorry. I'll never do it again. Here's your money back, plus an extra dollar. My class starts before yours, so I gotta go. Are we square now? If so, please tell your Uncle Louie. Well, okay. As long as Dominic's not hurt bad. Oh, come on, Dominic. Please wake up. Exit Johnny. Seconds later, Agostina rushes in. She immediately notices Dominic stretched out on his back and Carlo kneeling beside him. Carlo. Are you okay? Yes, Mama. What's the matter with Dominic? 
Oh. Johnny beat the move ahead with a hard blow. Luigi? Luigi! Enter Uncle Louie, annoyed. What's the matter now? Say get it, Christ. I have five minutes to talk with that driver and do business on the car phone. Luigi, the same bully what bammed my bambino done stomped your stupino. Is this a true, Carlo? Are you all right? Yes, Uncle Louis, yes to both. Except Johnny didn't stomp or kill Dominic. He got so scared, he beat Dominic with a baseball. And, and he checked out Dominic to make sure he's not dead or in a coma. And he apologized to me, paid me back, and, and promised that he'd never bother me again. Luigi. Luigi? Basta, Sororni. Basta. Enough. Sister, enough. Let's first see where Dominic is, okay? Dominic opens his eyes and looks around. Louis and Carlo help Dominic sit up, then get to his feet. Louis holds up his right hand with thumb and fingers outstretched. How many fingers am I holding up for Dominic? A whole bunch, boss. Uh, you know, ain't no good at math. Okay, okay. You can relax. Dominic will be fine. I'm sorry I let you down, boss. I was gonna let nobody do nothing to the, to the little man, but that kid beat me with a hard ball. It's okay, Dominic. As long as you are right, everything's taken care of. Or as we say in the old country, tuta a rasaluta. Now, off to school, Carlo. Don't be late for class. Yes, sir. Mama, Uncle Louie, Dominic, I'll see you all later. Have a great day. Exit Carlo, stage left. School's a start. So let's uh, get out of here. Take sister home and us to work. As I said, tuta e resoluta. End of play. A monologue by Earl Warner. An organ, I am. My name is Hart. Most think of me as just an organ, but that's understandable, especially in this day and age. I mean, this isn't a time of enlightenment. You know what I mean? I wonder if anyone would even believe there was a time that any that any that everyone was actually aware of there being an organ named heart, which was de designed as an instrument for converting mere perceptions of realities within the universe into expressions of the divine in a multitude of different forms, colors, mental images, sounds, rhythms created by vibrations. Well. That's exactly what I was designed to do. I am simply an instrument through which people are enabled to experience the divinity of their inner virtue or the inner nature of being in this world. I transform the constructions of their ideas about life and its relationships, beauty, peace, and harmony into sounds and expressions, which contain vibrations carried by magnetic waves across immeasurable spaces and time and emanating from the very source of all life. Through that, I and people, I and people are given a means of commuting with the spirit of life, which may be contained in mere thought forms, born of ideas which have carried over from life forces and influences from other planetary force fields within distant galaxies, familiar only to their souls. I am also an instrument capable of transmitting the voices of angels, which celebrate the whole of creation from millions of light years away and 
for delivering the thoughts and feelings of the living of the angelic realms and beyond. I am named heart because I am the voice for the expression and of the spirit of all life, love. Through that I am. The, the life of spirit within mankind may be strengthened and sustained, promoted and perpetuated throughout all time and space within the vast universe. Whoever, who would ever venture into a chapel anywhere in the world, not expecting to find that I am as the voice of the one and only truly supreme being who loves every single soul, which is giving life by virtue of space into every peace, mercy, kindness, compassion, and joyness. What if, what if every person in this world were an organ such as I am? And the entire world was given to a dance, to its music day to day. Would life not be an experience of which every single soul could truly? Great. End of monologue. Remember Me by Dante Henderson. We have Deborah, a mother, 60 years old. Don, her son, 30 years old. And Denise, her daughter, 33 years old. Scene one, at rise, two people sitting at a park bench eating lunch. My dear son, how long do you think it'll be before I'll forget who you are? Forget about today and this beautiful park and, and everything else. It varies from person to person. Nobody really knows. I mean, can you help me remember? I'm scared and I really don't know what to be afraid of. I read hundreds of pages concerning this disease and it all come back to the same conclusion. No cure. My wife and I, we'll look after you real good before things get too bad. I know, Sonny, but I love you both for that, but I don't want to become a burden when things get really bad. You're my mother. There will never be anything too bad. I read that some people urinate on themselves and walk off in the middle of the night. You changed thousands of diapers when I was a baby. We can hire a live-in nurse when things get that serious. What is life if it's not to exist knowing who you are and having a purpose to pursue while living? Create a new purpose to pursue before we leave here today. Off the top of my head? Why not? I feel I need to really think about it first. Can I get back to you next week? No, mom. You have to decide today, right now. That's how life is. There's no bliss without misery or perfect days without worse days. I guess we both had our fair share of ups and downs after your father left. I think I'll find happiness by helping others who are like me, forgetful. That's because, Mom, I think by assisting others, you will learn more about that disease. Then you'll learn more than any book could teach you. If you did force that, force that out of me, I probably would have just settled for a bucket list like everyone else. You're not the buck of this type, mom. You raised me to think of those in need since I was a child, visiting the homeless shelters. So it doesn't surprise me that you desire to help others who suffer from memory loss. I 
think I'll, I think I will create a self-help workbook that I can take with me that will aid me both, aid both me and the other person. See, that sounds fantastic. If you need help, I'll have a few weeks of vacation time saved up and uh, let me know when you're finished and I'll take a week off and help you get it edited and, you know, as a, we can work on it as a side project if you need me to. Thanks, son. I, I won't have you take off work for my project. I will use my old editor who helped me with my last book I wrote. But you can do me a favor and make sure I remember to finish the book by the end of the year. And try to make peace with your sister. It's been 10 years. Time should have healed your wounds by now. End of scene one. Scene two. The setting is at a dinner party at night in a ballroom at a fancy hotel in the winter. At rise, we see Deborah and Don at a dinner table near the front stage area of the ballroom and Denise walking to join them at the table. We got it done. I'm so happy that people around the world are getting help from my book. You did most of the work. I was just there to help keep you on schedule. Yes, your book turned out to be a bestseller overnight. Hey, Mama. Sorry I'm late, but the, the train was delayed an hour, so by the time I got to the hotel and, and dressed, I was already two hours late. Now, I don't want both of you running ruining this night. I want you to both fix your faces and pretend to act like adults for one night with your mother. I didn't know you invited her. Well, I did. You are both my children and I love you both equally. The past is the past. So let's move forward with the future. Do this, do this for me. I'm not the one who doesn't know how to move on, mama. I told this boy I'm sorry plenty of times. He never returned my call. That boy is a man who is your brother. If it takes you a hundred times, you do what it takes to fix things. With things the way they are, I don't want to lose you both to, and you both to hate each other. I don't hate her, mom. I hate what she did to us by stealing dad's life insurance policy and running off to travel the world. We almost lost everything. I hated having to watch you cry yourself to sleep at night when I came home from school after work. You know, you're right, Donnie. I was selfish and ruthless back then. I was young and stupid and I didn't give a darn about anybody but myself. So why are you here now? I'm here because our mother asked me to be here. Her and I have made up a long time ago. You see, son, the reason why we didn't lose the house was because I had her account frozen for fraud. She only stole a third of the money. A year later, after I found her in rehab, I forgave her and she's paid me back for the money over the years. Even if she didn't, I would never stop loving her. I know, Mom, but I remember. I remember how sick you got, losing all that weight. It was only us alone. With bad memories of Dad's death and a whole bunch of debt. You lost your car, our vacation house, in the mountains, everything. Mom, why didn't you tell me? I could have sent you money. I I had that good job at the power plant. I loved that house. Dad, Dad took us during the summer. Don, now that we're face to face, I need you to know that I'm wrong for how I treated you and mom. Like mom said last year to me, it's been over 10 years. The pain from those wounds, have healed many years ago. 
My only regret is the time that separated us. This night is a night that I will never forget. The night where my children make peace with one another on my ceremonial celebrated book. I was scared to sit down at first. The way Donnie looked at me, I thought he was gonna have me thrown out by my hair. <laughs> Not tonight, sis. But you do need to come by my house and meet my wife and your nephew and your baby niece. Mama told me their names. Each year I bought them a gift and well, now I can finally give them their gifts when I meet them. She hugs her brother. Sorry. I love you. Always have. I think it's time for me to accept my award. I'm going to watch this recording every night before I go to bed to remember the day I had my children together again. End of scene two. Scene three. The setting is a remodeled country mountain home once owned by Deborah's late husband. At rise, Denise, Deborah, and Don sit around a fire at night in the living room. I just laid my niece to bed. She fell asleep halfway through her bedtime story. Thanks, sis. Candace had a long day. I'm sure she appreciates your help. Who is Candace? Is that my granddaughter's name? No, that's my wife's name, Mom. Okay, if you say so. How has Mom been acting at home? Very forgetful. But she remembers more short-term things versus long-term memory. The doctor says she should need in-house care for at least another year. Well, if I can help... I will. I'm able to spend the weekends with her so you and your wife can have some free time with the kids. That would be much appreciated. We need a little breather. How are things going with you and Sam? It's going better now that we moved in together. Last week when I took mom out for lunch, he joined us and was very attentive to her. That was a side of him I have never saw before. Jack, dead, I'm ready for bed now. Jack was your husband's name. I'm your son, Don. I know you're my son, Donnie. I'm tired. You did a fine job fixing this play old place up. Your father would be so proud of you and your sister for buying the house back. I think dad would want us to keep it in the family. Well, good night, you two. I'll see you in the morning. Good night. Good night. Love you. Love you. She walks away. She looks so good for someone with Alzheimer's. I wonder if it's hereditary. The doctor says there's a, there's a high chance that one of us might develop symptoms later in life. Is there anything we can do to postpone or slow down the disease? Uh, there are vitamins, herbs, Exercises we can practice, like uh, brain games to help strengthen our minds. You know, I carry mom's last book she wrote with me in the car. Car When she visited the nursing homes and hospitals. Can you and I do something special for mom together? Of course. What do you have in mind? I want us 
to make a documentary about mom's life and name it after her last book? Uh, I'll call my office tomorrow, have them set aside some video equipment so we can get started on that right away. Remember Me will be something to help mom continue to remember. End of play. A Magical Realism Scene by Darnell Morris. The characters are Levi, 70 years old, a servant, caring and loving. And he met the other character through a turn of events. The other character is Molly, 30 years old, a servant, soft-spoken, easygoing, caring and loving. The setting is Honduras in 1350 AD. At 12.30 p.m. on a Saturday in the courtyard, and the king is seeing a bride from his hometown. Levi is looking out to somewhere far on the left side of the stage, and Molly is on the right side, sitting in a chair, concerned. Oh, I must find a bride for the Lord, my king. He's given me instructions to find a woman who is bathed in light, whatever that means. Oh, would I be joyful if the king would delight me to be his wife. But I'm poor and loneliest and lowly esteemed and have not any that care for me. Oh, the road is far and the way is broad, but I shall be, be fruitful in my endeavors. I shall successfully accomplish the mission that my king has set out for me to do. Giddy up, horse. All the noble women have decked their necks with pearls and painted their faces with glowing colors and have on the finest attire. But I have nothing. I, I see lots of people out in the courtyard. Oh yes, many women are out and they have seriously decked themselves with the finest attire and, and the jewels with light. I'm sure the king's servant will pass over me for I am nothing. Molly then takes out her Bible and reads it. The gold pages of the Holy Bible reflect on her face and the sun opens up the rest upon her. Oh my. There she is. Now I understand when my Lord said he, she must be bathed in light. I will approach this woman at once and ask her if she would like to be the queen. queen. Molly is tore up inside because she was always mistreated and because she was poor. All the noble women made fun of her, but she took refuge in reading the Bible and her trust in Jesus Christ became a delight to her soul. Now Levi approaches her and is amazed at the light that bathes her whole body. He hopes that she will accept his request. Excuse me there, my lady. Molly looks up at Levi and smiles at him, which is due to the comfort of the scriptures. Yes, me lord. I, I have arrived on behalf of the king who, who seeks a bride from his hometown. And the king has entrusted me to find a specific woman. And you, my lady, are her. Do you accept the king's proposal? She's shocked and thrilled and taken aback. She musters enough courage to say, Yes, I would be delighted to be the king's wife. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Praise God for his loving kindness and space for looking upon such a poor woman I am. Thank you, Lord. Then let's get going. Oh, thank you, Jesus, for making my endeavor successful. Praise God for his loving kindness and grace and that he, he helped his servant in finding a wife for my Lord, the King, for she was bathed in light as my Lord, the King requested. Thank you, Lord. End of scene. An autumn inspired scene by Thomas Warren. The characters are Sammy, 
a nine-year-old boy, headstrong, and the brother to Phoebe. Phoebe is nine and a half years old, a tomboy, and Sammy's sister. The setting is fall, in their backyard, under the old maple tree. At rise, Sammy and Phoebe are just finishing raking leaves into a pile, letting their rakes fall from their hands. Wow, look at that. He looks up and down the huge pile of leaves, rubbing his hands together. Yeah, I get to go first. Walk, she walks back so she can get a running start. Hey, nah, why do you get to go first? He steps between his sister and the leaf pile. Because I'm the oldest. He can't argue. She's older than him, but he won't give up that easily. So? Asia ain't got nothing to do with it. Ma says so. You know I'm right. Always telling us, wait till you're older. You'll understand when you're older. <sighs> Must have to be important. Again, Sammy can't argue, but he still doesn't concede. Nah, that ain't got nothing to do with the pile jumping. Okay, so how are we gonna figure this? Who goes first? I figure I raked from the DD barn to the house and back to the tree. Now, that's a lot. Okay, well, I raked from the high garden to the low garden, round the chicken coop and back to the tree. Whew, now that's a lot. Yep, yeah, that's a lot. But I done about the same as you did. So who goes first? Guess we gotta play for it. She puts her right fist in the open palm of her left. Ah, uh, heck, if we gotta. One. Two. Three. Shoot! A hush falls on the stage. The lights dim, and as the lights come up, we see Sammy's tiny fist as a rock. And Phoebe is holding out scissors. I won. I won. Oh, shoot. Just then, their dog Pepper rushes past them both, happily smashing through the huge pile of leaves and scattering them to the four winds. They both say, Aww. Aww. End of scene. A comedy scene by Darnell Morris. The characters are Jimmy, an 80-year-old male, grumpy, and Macrone, a 40-year-old male who's timid and passive. The setting is a tennis match at a stadium, midday, in France, a Sunday, at 4 p.m., it's the championship. At rise, Jimmy is looking at the tennis match with a frowned, angry face. I can't believe this. He hasn't made a point. I spent my life savings on this game and I'm not even betting on it. Mama was right. I'm a garage door opener. What shall I do if they ask me about tennis questions? I don't know any answers. I just know about telling people to, to sit here, sit there, sit over here, sit over there. Jimmy stands up yelling, and Macron looks up at him. You're not playing hard enough to this ball, Harris. You have to put power in your ankle, son. Or else you won't hit nothing, racquetball head. Oh, dear. Just what I need, an angry confrontation with a tennis fan. What shall I say to him? I'll just ask him what the problem is and, and see if he would like to sit here, 
over there or over here or over there? If that doesn't work, maybe I'll ask him if he would like some crunchy berry cereal. Ah, you lost the mother bitch. How could you? Ah, you have to put power in your elbow, son. Oh, small head, nothing. See this small head. Uh, uh, excuse me, sir. What seems to be the problem? I'll tell you what the problem is. I hitchhiked all the way from California to get here. And I spent my life savings on this ticket just to see an underdog go back to his job. Oh, well, uh, if you would, would you mind uh, shutting your mouth so that other people could enjoy the game? Who are you telling to shut their mouth? You shut your mouth. I'm a taxpaying citizen from California. I'm a GD. And I know how to swing fish nets. And I'm not a noisy. I'm quiet and polite. Now what match is coming up? And why is everybody here fast saying, bonjour? Bonjour means good morning, sir. Well, what match is coming up? Oh, no. I have not been paying attention. I am not a good stewardess. What if he complains of me? What should I do? Well, the match is coming up. Uh, um, well, uh, would you like to sit over here, over there, or over here? What do you mean? Would I like to sit over here, over there, over here? I have a seat already. Have you not? As he looks at Macron strangely with squinting eyes before Macron speaks. Would you like some Captain Crunch cereal? I, I thought you know this. End of scene. A monologue by Thomas Warren. I am a prison bed. I'm six feet long. If I'm an inch, most find me to be long and sturdy enough. Some men are taller than I am long. And their feet push past my bottom bar, exposing their toes to the chill, the chilly night air. I do not do anything. I lie and wait. But no matter what, no matter what time, day or night, you need me. I'm there. Some think I'm cozy. Others lumpy. Some sigh when they lay down on me. Others, though they'll never admit it, cry. <laughs> Sometimes all through the night. I'm a secret keeper. I have a head and a foot, but no mouth to speak. I'm always ready to receive your worry, bones, and provide comfort and safety. I'm the ever silent, always vigilant protector of your dreams, the progenitor of your nightmares. The one place that in here is truly yours. A monologue by Darnell Morris, titled Helena. Oh, I can't believe my spiders ate my turtles again. They were supposed to be friends. How could they do such a thing? Maybe I should spank them or give them a curfew? <laughs> One thing is for certain, they have to stop eating my turtle babies. 
I've, I've tried separating them, but those dang daddy long legs keep putting their skinny long legs over the cage to eat my precious turtle babies. I guess, I guess the only thing left to do is to buy some African turtles to fend them off, to fend off them spiders. Yes, that'll do it. Soon as those spiders put one of them long legs in the turtle's cage, they shall go back home wounded because African red polka dot turtles mean business. Huh. End of scene. A monologue by Vassar Will Smith. I, Maurice, am a middle-aged man, single by choice, in, in what you would call the late Middle Ages. I am a benevolent practitioner of the occult. I am a white magician. I do no harm to no one except to prevent evil from harming the innocent. My spirit is eternal but my last physical body lived in 15th century France under the Valois dynasty. Perhaps the most notorious of those was King Louis VI, who was a strong ruler, but so, but so cruel and creepy that he was called Le Roi de Rog, the Spider King. He actually did torment his favorite prisoners by imprisoning them in exposed cages on the palace roof. And he would, he would call them his little cage birds oh, and demand that they sing for him. If they refused, he would light a fire under the cage to make them sing. Oh, many, many suffered horribly and some died from such treatment. Uh, don't be misled by that English splattern who writes idiotic books about adolescent wizards, uh, Magnus or Mage, has uh, assistance from, from angels and can and, and occasionally procure help from demons, but can do very little without the aid of higher powers. Like Paraclesius, I've lived in an age when most people believed in, in such powers. That belief made possible at that time, many phenomena considered impossible today. End of scene.